January for the kind of open house. All right, so a good number of you as well. So in January, we really spent some time talking about the life of the high school, and we had an opportunity to tour the building and really just have a sense of what the layout of this place is. Tonight, we're gonna to focus much more on the program of studies. So we will talk a little bit about the schedule in general for your students, but we're really gonna focus on um, you know, the decisions that your students have to make over the next couple of weeks in terms of their program of studies, courses that they may take next year. We have our department leaders here this evening and they can answer more department-specific questions, but we're gonna to try to give you a pretty good overview of what our schedule looks like because our schedule is definitely different than the middle school. I guarantee you, within the first week of school, your students will get used to it. Um, it may take you a little bit longer, but your students will get used to it within the first week because they're living it every day. We do have a rotating schedule. We'll get through all of that, where students are able to see their teachers every single day. In some high schools, students may not see their, their classes every day. They may see them every other day. For us, our students are seeing their, their teachers every single day. So we'll go through what that looks like for our high school, um, and you'll get a pretty good sense. What I do like to say before we start this evening is it's overwhelming the amount of information that's available, and that is why this is just one of many opportunities to learn more about our high school. As I said, in January, you had a sense of kind of the layout of our school and what some of the daily life might be like. Tonight, we will go through quite a bit in terms of the courses and our program of studies. We are recording this this evening, and we will be posting it on the, our website, and I will talk to the middle school about doing a link on their website as well, so you can always go back and view this. We're recording it for any families who weren't able to attend this evening as well. There's a ton of information on our website. We'll get through all of those resources as well. So you do not need to remember everything we're going through tonight. So I just wanna make sure that's really clear. If you remember a little bit of tonight, fantastic, okay? So running through the agenda tonight, as I said, we really wanna talk a little bit about what that, that transition's gonna look like coming from the middle school to the high school. So I am Nicole Bottomley. I am the principal here at the high school. I am in my 10th year in this district. Um, I love it here. I know I'm biased because I work here, but I do really love it here. And we have some phenomenal people that you will meet tonight who love this school just as much and care very much about the success that your students have coming in. And I just want to be clear when I say success, I'm not necessarily talking about grades, although we want your students to master what they're learning as they go through their academics, but success in terms of how they define it and success in terms of being really well-rounded, happy individuals who learn a tremendous amount through their four years here. And we want to help put structures in place so that that transition from eighth to ninth grade can be as smooth as possible. We'll talk a little bit about some of the extracurricular activities that we have, um, and then we'll go through a little bit in more in detail our scheduling process, our course recommendations, and then departmental information. We'll spend about a half an hour in here going through some general information, and then we'll have our department leaders in a couple of classrooms. We'll actually send you off into a few classrooms, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions that are more specific to the different departments we have here. So we have, um, nine different departments here. You'll have an opportunity to ask uh, questions about math or science, performing arts, whatever type of questions um, that you might have that are more specific to that. And we'll also hear from our department leaders in those breakout sessions so they can tell you a little bit more about the course offerings that they have. So in terms of our department leaders, as I said, we do have nine departments here. Um, we have eight department leaders. You will meet them this evening, but they're all clustered down here in front. Um, so Mr. Quinley, our English department leader, giving a wave over there. Uh, Mr. Lack for Fine and Performing Arts. Ms. Ross for School Counseling, and you will hear a lot from her this evening. She is sharing the microphone with me this evening. Uh, Ms. Canoni for Math and Business. Ms. Bodmer for Science and Technology. Ms. Lasher for Social Studies, Ms. Moreau for Wellness, and Mr. Chaton for World Language. So you will have an opportunity to get to know them a little bit better in our breakout sessions later on. In terms of the administrative team, as I said, I'm Nicole Bottomley, I'm the principal here. We have two assistant principals. So we have Mr. Cook, who's in the back, giving a, a wave as well. Our, our assistant principals are responsible for two grades. So Mr. Cook currently has ninth and 11th graders. 
Our assistant principals will travel with the students. So Mr. Cook will have the ninth graders as they move into 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. So it's a nice sort of consistent person for those four years. We have an interim assistant principal right now, Mr. Sudmeyer, who is fantastic, but we knew he was in a one-year interim position. So we are going to be hiring for an assistant principal to join our team. We actually have that posted right now. Our goal is to have somebody at least announced by the end of the spring. That person will be responsible for ninth and 11th grade next year. So that's why um, I don't have the name of the person who will be working with your students yet, but I guarantee you we will have a phenomenal person to greet your students as they come in. That being said, our entire administrative team works with all of our students regardless of their, their grade level here. We also have our student service administrator, Ms. Condon. And then our athletic director, who's not in here this evening, but our athletic director, Mr. Baker, and you'll have communication from him as we move through the spring. In terms of registration for athletics, that starts at the end of the spring. So your eighth graders who are interested in playing any kind of sports here at the high school, they'll start getting information or notifications um, in May and June. And then we open that registration period and it goes through mid-summer. So just kind of keep your eyes out for that, but just know that they are starting to register at the end of the school year for ninth grade sports. <coughs> In terms of our transitional support, so your students will also have a school counselor. Our school counselors will stay with your students for the four years. Now that being said, we do sometimes make some adjustments. Our goal is to have a pretty even distribution um, across all four counselors in terms of their caseload, the number of students that they work with, so that they can provide the best possible services for your students. But for the most part, um, we have a breakdown by the alphabet and your student will also have that person for all four years. I went through some of the different supports. We have some adjustment counselors who work here, social worker, school psychologist, and then we also have a campus supervisor who really helps to make sure that things are running smoothly around here, but is also an extension of the office. And Mr. Pre um, Priest is wonderful. He has great relationships with, with students. He's a real support for students. He's in the cafeteria every day during lunch duty. He gets to know everyone, and they really do see him as a resource as well. So I, I take the time to go through all of this because I do want you to understand that I know the transition from eighth to ninth grade can be challenging. We do everything we can to make sure that there are a ton of supports in place so that if your students do need additional people to speak with, you know that we have those people ready and willing to help assist your students. We'll also do some supports um, throughout the year. The eighth graders are all up here this, this week. We had 90 eighth graders here today, 70 yesterday, and 66 tomorrow. Um, so they come up for the half days, which is great because it really does give them an idea of what to expect here at the high school. They attend a class. And then in the summer, at the end of August, we'll have a ninth grade orientation for them as well. We have a number of online resources, so our program of studies for next year is posted on the website. If you go on the website, it's one of the drop-down tabs. We have our student parent handbook. You can see that for this year. We update it every summer, so we won't be posting our, our updated one for next year until we get to August, but you can have a sense of sort of what some of the policies or procedures are. And then the school counseling office has a really extensive and robust website that provides a lot of information for you about guidance, uh, school counseling seminars, um, and just a, a wealth of information about social emotional supports as well as post-secondary planning, whatever that may be for your individual student. I'm not saying that we're having that conversation now. They're just coming into ninth grade, but I just want you to know there's a whole lot of different things that our school counselors will do. So I am very fortunate to turn it over to Ms. Ross, who is fantastic. She is our school counseling department leader, and she is a wealth of knowledge and information. No pressure. So she's gonna come up and talk a little bit about graduation requirements, and then a lot of um, the pieces when it comes to scheduling. So come on up, Ms. Ross. It's a tall order now. Okay, so we're going to start with graduation requirements because really this is sort of what we're working towards, right? So the end in mind. And we're looking for four credits in all of the major subject areas, so English, Math, Science, Social Studies, and then two credits in World Language, um, two credits in Wellness, and then a credit in Fine and Performing Arts. 
Sounds like a lot, but that's actually, um, there's actually a lot more room in their schedules to take even more credits than that. So we asked them to earn 26 credits to graduate. However, many students end up graduating with more than that. So there's, there's some room, there's some room for uh, mistakes. Um, there is some room for exploration. And that's really what we wanna see the students do while they're here. So at the high school, we have a block schedule and it's made up of two semesters. So semester one and semester two, and those semesters are divided into quarters. So we have four quarters. Um, many term classes run for just that term or a quarter, and those classes are a half a credit. So our wellness classes, essay writing, foundations of 21st century learning, and a number of our electives, our term classes. Our core classes are semesters, um, and that would be English, Math, Science, Social Studies, and World Language, and those get one credit um, on the transcript. All students take eight credits every year. So um, it's a lot packed into a year. There's a lot of movement, there's a lot of transition term to term. Um, so that's always something to be mindful of with your particular student and something actually the school counselors would love to know. If your student struggles with transition, it would be helpful for us to know that. So then we can help them through that. The rotating log schedule um, is, as you can see behind me, I'm still getting used to the new times that we're going to have next year. So we will be starting at 8, 10 a.m. I might get to see my kids in the morning, which is exciting. Um, and we'll be ending at 2.43. Um, there are four blocks in the day, and like, like the, the title suggests, they rotate. So um, if your student is not a morning person, it will not hit the same course every day. Uh, it's going to hit a different course. There is a DSV block, so a directed study block, which is um, free time, which students can use to check in with teachers, they can work on their homework, um, there might be an extra lab for a class or an extra study session if the test is coming up. Really, there's a lot of possibilities in that time. Um, some students use it as like a high school recess and they just relax and that's fine too. A lot of students come meet with their school counselors during um, DSB, so it's a time that, that we find very productive um, here at the high school. Um, the lunch block is a little bit longer. Um, it was 25 minutes to um, uh, account for um, the extra lunch, and that's the third block of the day. This is a sample schedule for a student who might be in an honors level math class. Um, you will see that there are, um, there's a lot more space for electives on this schedule. Um, it might be kind of hard to read, but um, if you go from sort of left to right, you'll see term one, term two, term three, and term four. So term one and term two, semester one, term three, and term four, semester two. Um, you'll see um, at the bottom under D block, those are our um, wellness essay writing foundations of 21st century learning. Those are the required courses for freshman students. So um, those will appear on most of their schedules. And in this particular case, they'd have some exploration time through their electives. In this sample schedule, you're going to see a student that's actually in a CP1 math course, uh, which extends the full year and is divided into two parts. So you'll see Algebra 1 Part 1 and Algebra 1 Part 2. Um, and that leaves a little less space for an elective, but there is still some space. Um, and as students in that CP1 track move on, there will become more and more opportunity to take more electives. So as they move into sophomore and then junior and senior year. We have four levels of courses here. We have advanced placement courses, uh, which are essentially the equivalent of college level courses, honors, CP1, college preparatory, and then college preparatory two, CP2. And really, um, the differences around pace and uh, all of that information and how those levels differentiate can be found in the program of studies. Um, and I think it's important to read through those to make sure that your student is placed accordingly. These are our current AP offerings. Uh, we actually are going to have 21 AP 
courses offered next year. Um, as an AP coordinator, that's a little frightening, uh, but it is a great opportunity for students to try these challenging college level courses. Um, the students can start taking AP courses beginning their sophomore year um, in terms of AP European History and AP Physics I, um, but the rest of them tend to come later in the upperclassmen years. These are uh, some examples of some new elective offerings that we have here. So uh, in the past couple of years, it's been really exciting. There's been this sort of surge of energy um, from the teachers because administration has really opened up the opportunities for them to teach in their passion areas. So we have a lot more electives. Uh, when I see this, I think to myself, wow, high school would have been a lot more fun if I was able to take courses like this. So, um, and Assuming you can read that, but some examples, True Crime Narratives is a podcasting class that uh, one of our English teachers uh, has uh, found passion in, and the students love it. Um, Eco Challenge, Voices of Holliston, another podcasting class. So some of these courses are really trying to help the students acquire some 21st century skills um, that are really uh, different from students in the past, right? So podcasting being one of those skills, but there's a lot of great offerings. So going into scheduling, this is one thing I want you to remember when you leave. So you don't have to remember much, but one thing to remember is that students need to select eight credits of core and elective classes. So it has to equal eight credits. Students should also select at least two alternate electives, and I cannot stress this more because the school counselors are working on schedules oftentimes when students are busy preparing for final exams and so on, or even when the students have left the building, including you know middle school students are off for their summer. And if we cannot get them into their first choice selective, we really want the option so that we can put them somewhere that they might be happy. If a student doesn't select a lot of alternates and we can't get them into their first choice, they might have an option they don't like. And that sometimes happens. So, Please make sure to put in as many alternate electives as the system allows you. Again, the more the better. Uh, current eighth graders will be automatically enrolled into the Wellness 9 Foundations and Essay Writing courses. Those will automatically appear when you go into the system to do course selection. So entering courses into PowerSchool, uh, the portal, I guess, for lack of a better word, will open on Friday, March 6th at 4 p.m. And that's when you can start entering courses. It will close without question 9 p.m. on Monday, March 16th. So that gives two weekends um, and a full week in there to really work on this. Uh, students have to enter the eight credits before they can submit. But during that time frame, if you submit and then you say, oh wait, we want to change an elective, you can go back in and continue to update until 9 p.m. March 16th, okay? Um, so you're gonna log into Unified Classroom, you'll select the quick links in the left navigation pane, and then there's the class registration in the quick links, which is circled in red on the screen. You're then going to see uh, the courses that the student has been recommended for. That's what's going to show up. Um, in the red box, you're going to see that's up on the screen. You'll see an exclamation point that is in red. The exclamation point indicates that action needs to be taken. So you need to choose that course um, that's been recommended. Um, or you need to choose electives, and once that's complete, it shows up as a green check mark. So this is an example of an English registration. So what shows up is the course that the student has been recommended for. If you're not in agreement with that recommendation, we will talk about that process in a minute. However, we do find that the recommendations the teachers make are really solid. And most of the time, it is the right choice for the student. We also encourage students, when we met with the students, to think about balance, um, to think about the fact that this is their first year, and I always like to think of ninth grade as sort of the foundation of a house, right? If we're building a house, that foundation has to be strong, and this transition can be very challenging for some students, even if they don't think it's going to be. 
um, it's, a, it's a challenge. And so we want to make sure that they have the academic balance. So we want to see rigorous schedules, but we don't want to see students overdoing it and then finding themselves in a situation where they can't participate in an extracurricular or they don't sleep. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, because that just compounds itself. So really thinking about the recommendations that the teachers make as being a sound option for your student. So this is an example of the preloaded uh, courses that all freshmen will have: Wellness Nine, Essay Writing, and Foundations of 21st Century Learning. For Art One Honors, Learning Support Students, special situations like that, the school counselors will manually uh, take those out and then add in what needs to be added in terms of Learning Support, Art One, and, and so on. Um, so that's a manual process. You'll see at the bottom, the bottom uh, red box, it says uh, requires eight credit hours, so it's going to tell you that it requires the eight credits and it's requesting um, additional credits for alternates. Um, and it won't let you move on without those. So choose enough core courses and electives to complete the eight credits. Um, again, every effort is made. I trust me, every effort is made by the school counselors to give a student their first choice elective. We do not come to work every day wanting to make children miserable. We want to make them happy. We would give them everything that they wanted in terms of electives if we could. It doesn't always happen. However, those electives will fit in sometime in their four years, okay? Um, so, so know that we're making that best effort. And then again, make sure you choose at least two alternate electives. So the electives pages in PowerSchool, they can be a little tricky. Sometimes people just stay on page one. There are multiple pages which is exciting because there's lots of options. So make sure that you page through. At the bottom it will say next page, so don't just pick from that first page. Keep moving through um, the elective offerings um, that are there. And this is just a second screen to show you that it moves on to an, another page. The alternate electives, again, it will show up with a red exclamation point showing that action is needed here and that you need to enter some alternate electives. We told the students today, and I'll reiterate to you, the Program of Studies is a beautiful resource that takes a lot of time and effort on the part of the department leaders. It is a description of every course we offer, core and elective. So if a student is not sure what an elective is about, they shouldn't be putting it down without reading what they're getting into first, okay? Um, so read the descriptions, and I would encourage students to keep an open mind, too. So they may read a description and say, actually, I'm not interested in this, but I'm kind of interested in this, and I wasn't expecting that. So um, definitely take some time on the program of studies. The flag for counselor assistance is available if students have a recommendation to be in an honors class but actually want to be in a CP1 class instead. Um, it is not to be used for overrides moving up. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. It's not to be used for, um, you know, I want this elective but I don't see it. It's really to be used for that movement down because you can only pick what is recommended. Okay, so if, you, if your student says, you know what, I know I've been recommended for English 9 honors, but I'm thinking my balance next year might be a little off, I'm gonna do US History 1 honors and do English 9 CP1. I'm gonna hit the flag for counselor assistance and that's where you enter the information. It's basically your name and a short description of what it is that you're flagging. It appears at the bottom of the course selection screen, and again, do not use it for overwriting. We'll talk about that now. So the override process should be thought about very carefully, um, and it should be done now, because any overrides that are done within this time frame before April 17th, which is when overrides are due, will be factored into the overall numbers when we create the master schedule. Anything done outside of that time, the student may find that there are no seats left in the class. Uh, we do get some students that come in August and say, hey, I've had time to mature over the summer. I really think I can do that honors class. And we will do our best effort, you know, make our best effort 
um, through the override process to find them a seat in the class, but it's not always guaranteed. So they really should think about what they think they're going to be capable of, capable of now. Um, they should read the descriptors about the different levels in the program of studies. Um, elect the course that you were recommended for until the override process is complete. So those override forms come to the school counselors at the high school and then we make the changes manually in the system. The student and the parent have to meet with the middle school teacher who made the recommendation. The override form can be found on the website and that form gets signed by all parties and then it gets handed in to Ms. Tucker, who's the 8th grade substitute school counselor down at Rams this um, spring, and that has to be handed in by April 17th. Okay, so um, if you have any questions about that, Ms. Tucker can help you through it, um, but this is an important process. The discussion really is about this is why I recommended you for this level, and this is what you would need to do to be successful at the level you're asking for. <laughs> and it's really a, a contract around sort of, yes, I think I'm capable of doing that. You know, we want the student to be aware of what they need to do to be capable of succeeding at that, that level that they want to move up in. So next steps uh, for you, complete the online course requests by March 16th at 9 p.m., all right, eight credits. If needed, you're going to complete the override form by April 17th, and then final schedules will be made available online over the summer so that students can get a sense for what their balance feels like. If students look at their schedule, and we do try to balance them so that semester one and semester two are you know, in sync and you don't have all four classes one semester and then all electives and lighter classes second semester, sometimes that's just the way it works, but we really try not to do that. If for some reason that is what your child's schedule looks like, you'll schedule a meeting with your high school counselor. So, and that will, that will come out in August. All right, breakout sessions. Is that you, Ms. Bottomley? That's me. Okay. Um, so we have just a couple minutes before we send people off. I am going to take this opportunity, though, to have our department leaders head off to the classroom so they can get situated. And then if anyone has any general questions, not department-specific questions, but any general questions about some of the information we just went over, um, either myself or Ms. Ross can answer those questions. So I saw your hand back there. So I'll do my best to um, paraphrase or repeat the questions because I recognize with the acoustics in here and without a microphone, it's not always easy to hear. So the question that I'm gonna paraphrase, it was essentially, things are changing in really good ways. So things are changing at the elementary school, middle school, and high school in terms of how we approach the educational experience. At the high school, we're working on vision of a graduate. So what are those skills and characteristics we want all students to have as they leave Holliston High School? For example, global citizen or continuous learner, or a balanced life. At the middle school, they're talking about personal, local, and global, and what that impact is on themselves, their local community, the global community, and how do they fit into those different pieces. At the elementary schools, they're really talking about the different programs they have there in terms of how they interact with each other. How can they be involved in their community? Those are our, our youngest learners. How do they have a voice? that's developmentally appropriate, but how do they start building that voice? So the question was, is that sort of contradicting what you just heard in terms of fairly fixed levels around CP1 or honors or AP and moving up or moving down and student being capable of something? The short answer is, yes, yep. So what I would say to that is the short answer is we are very much a work in progress right now. 
So this presentation now versus a year from now versus two years from now may be very different. Part of that is between last year and this year, we have 40 new classes going in. Many of those classes are bringing in new ideas, new instructional practices, new ways of interacting. So we are constantly trying to, to move our individual student experiences as well as our systemic experiences. So our procedures, our policies, how we view classes and schools. Growth mindset absolutely is a principle that we value here. So growth mindset, the idea that you haven't mastered it yet, but everybody has that capability. So I don't, and if, if, if the message we gave was a more of a fixed mindset, that's not our intention, and that's good feedback for us in terms of moving forward. We very much embody growth mindset. That being said, what I would say is everybody comes in at a different entry point, right? So I have, decent tech skills, but I would not say I'm super tech savvy. Somebody else coming along might be really tech savvy. So for them, they may be able to jump into an advanced computer science class and do quite well. I would probably struggle initially. I would probably need a more basic intro level before I could jump up, right? That's not to say I can't get there, but my entry point is gonna be in a different place. And I think when we have the different levels, part of it is what are those entry points? What are the skills students are bringing with them already? How can we meet them where they're at and then help them continue to grow and develop? Yeah. So I've seen students that start here at the high school, start in all CP2 classes and end up taking honors classes in their senior year. So there is growth. There is that growth mindset. So a student is not tracked. A student is not, you know, they come in as a CP1 student, they're not always a CP1 student. They could be an honors level student, you know, in one area, um, and a CP1 level student in another. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, the way we structure things right now, but no student is tracked. If a student is showing success in an area, we will meet that student where they're at and allow them to, you know, not allow them, encourage them, support them as they want to move up in the different classes, okay? Does that make, does that make sense? on the map, I definitely do. Um, so 26 is our minimum number of credits to graduate, and we do have some students who graduate with 26 credits for a variety of reasons. Most of our students will graduate with 32. Some of our students might actually graduate with more because they have done some other pieces as they go along. So I hear you in terms of the eight credits, um, and eight times four, and I'm with you on the math. So most of our students will graduate with 32 credits. For us, graduation minimum is 26 credits for the overall bucket, as I refer to it. And within that overall bucket, then you have the specific number of credits in each particular area. You may have a student who absolutely loves science, and they may graduate with five or six credits in science, and that's where that sort of wiggle room comes in, because we really do want to support the individual passions that students have. Yep. There are no credits for extracurricular sports, so after school sports, and that's actually a regulation of the state of Massachusetts. Um, there are wellness credits, so we actually offer a number of different wellness classes. You'll hear more about that in the breakout session, but we have a rock climbing class. I mean, we have some great stuff here. Um, in terms of credits, we have a number of opportunities as students progress through high school to take internships and do independent projects. And so there's a lot of different creative ways to earn credits. We have some students who are building a tiny house on a trailer um, out back. I mean, there's some really, really great stuff that's happening, but in terms of like an after school job or something after two o'clock, we typically don't um, award credit for that. I saw a hand over here, yep. Yeah, we're, we're gathering the numbers, okay. and then the master schedule will figure it out. 
So the question was really, if you sign up for everything on day one versus day 10, does that matter? No, that window is open. As long as you're in there by nine o'clock on the deadline, that's fine. We gather all of that data together before we run the master schedule. And actually there's quite a bit that happens between gathering all that data and actually running the, the master schedule in terms of going back. And this is where the human element comes in to make sure that even though the computer told everybody to have X number of credits, that everybody has what they need. We go back, we do a lot of double checking, we look to see what are the requests students have, and so there's a, there's a lot that factors into that. Yep. For the electives, can they state their preferences one to 10, or are they just choosing their kind of? probably have time for one or two more just because I'm sure the department leaders are wondering why I still have you in here. So, yes. So on Friday, when we open up the scheduling window, you will actually see in there that some pieces are already recommended. So for example, your English, your student's English teacher will have already in there recommended the level. So the question was when we know what the recommendations are, um, when that window opens up, you will see those recommendations. And then I saw your hand back there. In theory, on Friday when we open it up, but there may be some sneak peeks. Yes, go ahead. So the question was, is there a difference in the weight for honors CP1, CP2, AP? Yes and no. So we have an unweighted GPA, which is essentially these are the classes you're taking, these are the grades that you're earning. We do have a weighted GPA, but it's not actually what we send to colleges. So there is a little bit of a difference, but essentially what we're looking at is what is the best fit for your individual student. Um, we're, it, it's something we're also looking at, but for the most part, I mean, what's on the transcript is the unweighted GPA. Um, it just lists the courses and what the, the level is, but it's the unweighted GPA that will be listed. So I would say make the choice as far as the learning experience that best fits where your child's entry point is. All right, so this is what we're gonna do for the breakout sessions. If you have last names A through D, you are gonna be going to room 300.